we find ourselves at a unique time, um, a period in time where we're all searching for answers to a problem whose scope is beyond anything that we have encountered before. And it's affected our jobs, our families, and our communities. It is in the word community that we will find the solutions to empower, to emerge stronger <laughs> and more resilient than ever. Tamrac is supporting the conversation around COVID and recovery uh, through a brunch chat that we held um, in May. And we are also currently working on com how communities can develop a COVID and community 10 guide. So stay tuned for that. Paul Bourne is, is leading on that and that should be coming out very soon. Uh, communities across the globe are starting to move from crisis to recovery in response to COVID. But how might we, how might we alter the traditional recovery methods of the top-down approach and to think about recovery with an asset-based lens and put community at the center? We're going to hear from Paul Bourne, who is the co-CEO of Tamrac Institute, who's going to be talking about asset-based community development and how it has shaped the work that we do at Tamrac and how we're looking at COVID recovery and community. Then we're going to hear from Jonathan Massamy, who is from the city of Kitchener, and he's going to be talking about the asset-based renewal framework that he's been working on. Then we're going to hear from Deborah Jacobek from Abundant Community Edmonton as they talk about how they have been working at the citizen level and how it has helped in their recovery. I also want to mention that, that both um, the City of Kitchener and the City of Edmonton are members of our city's deepening community membership and working on developing neighborhood strategies um, at community centers and, and within uh, neighborhoods. So for the next 30 minutes, sit back and get ready to be inspired. Over to you, Paul. Great, thanks everyone. And, and thanks Heather for, uh, for, for bringing us into the room. Um, really appreciate Jonathan and Deborah, you taking the time to come and share your story. Uh, and for all of you to share your story as you're gonna go into groups and, and talk to one another. Uh, Dee Brooks uh, out of Australia has done a huge amount of work around this. And uh, Howard, thanks for giving us support. Rute, thanks for giving us support uh, technically on this. And of course, uh, John McKnight and Jody, who have uh, really founded ABCD, always indebted to them, true mentors uh, for me. Um, I, um, as Heather said, um, I'm just trying to share my screen here, Rute. Um, Maybe I'll let you do whatever you got to do magically. Um, here we go. So we've been, we interviewed a whole ton of community leaders and uh, we're putting together a 10 guide is what we call it, which is 10 good ideas, um, 10 stories uh, around post COVID recovery. And you're really the first public group to ever see this. Like, it's just fresh. We haven't written it yet. It's raw, so I thought I would just leave it up here while I speak, um, and you can kind of go through it. Uh, we can send it out to you as well as we're preparing for it. So the Tamarack Institute, our, our work is to end poverty, uh, to deepen community, a sense of community, and most recently building youth futures, and we're just starting a new initiative around helping communities transition uh, over the next 10 years around climate change. We are active, that means that these are municipalities that are members of our work, uh, just over 400 municipalities um, in Canada. Um, and so we work as partners. To give you a sense of just some of our outcomes, when we started this work, there were no cities with uh, poverty reduction strategies. Now there are 340 every province, every territory, and the federal government have one. Uh, we reduced poverty for somewhere around 14% when we started, and it's now at a historic low in Canada at 8.7%. Uh, we think once we get through COVID, we'll be uh, back on our way down to 7 or 6%. And I truly believe within the next 10 years, we will end poverty uh, in our country. It's just really that level of commitment, and maybe my own naive optimism, I'm not sure, but we're getting so close and it's exciting. Uh, to support all this work, we have a learning center that has about 30,000 learners 
that work with us every month, that engage and learn with us. We're in over a thousand cities in Canada and um, 800 in the US and another uh, 900 around the world. We have members all over that are learning and working with us. Um, we write a lot of papers, we do a lot of webinars, about 25,000 people come to our webinars every year. And so it's an exciting uh, place to be and to learn and to grow. Now, the work of asset-based community development is at the core of who we are as the Tamarack Institute. Our, our challenge is to move community change work from doing for communities for the work being done by communities. So it's not that we want to see systems where experts come in and help people, but we want experts who are experts at helping people to come up with their ideas and to implement their own solutions. And that's really the change. And so we, we specialize in the work of citizen action of community engagement and ultimately how to have a collective impact uh, when we work together toward large scale change. You know, when we first started working at the issue of poverty reduction some 20 years ago, uh, we, we were a very large economic development organization working in many cities. Um, and at one point the United Nations came to us and awarded us one of the 40 best practices in the world. We were surprised by that because poverty had actually gone up in our cities, not down. And so we wondered why we would be recognized as one of the best. Um, what we came to realize over the next years, and that's really was the foundation of our cities reducing poverty work, is that when everyone in a community changes just a little bit, it's a whole lot more impactful than a great organization helping communities change. Just let me repeat that. If everybody in a community buys into a change, wants to work together at that change, it's far more impactful than experts coming in and uh, sharing what they think the change should be and maybe forcing it upon people. I was just on a webinar with Heather and she was just sharing this simple idea and we do a lot of work in the citizen role in disaster preparedness, um, that one of the things that is probable, almost inevitable, is that your first responder in a disaster uh, will never be an expert first responder, re responder. It will almost always be your neighbor. So we have a vested interest in neighbors knowing one another, in neighbors connecting, in helping neighbors to identify the assets that they have and to help realize the value of those assets um, for the broader good of community. Lots more to say. Uh, just really grateful to all of you for wanting to be more knowledgeable about asset-based community development, to be part of the solution that is helping communities to do for themselves um, and to create a better world. Uh, we need you desperately in these times of COVID, hoping that these 10 ideas uh, have inspired you a little bit that have been on the screen, um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll keep sharing them with you and eventually the 10 guide that comes out of them. Thanks so much. I look forward to the work that Jonathan and Deborah are sharing, uh, which is just utterly amazing. Thank you. All the best. Over Thank to you, you Heather. Thank you, Paul. And so, Jonathan, you are up. Uh, thanks for your words, Paul. Um, I'm going to set my timer. I think I have 10 minutes. Um, all right, let's begin. Uh, so, what you see on your screen is a COVID 19 asset base uh, renewal uh, framework uh, for communities. Uh, just to give you a little uh, preamble, uh, how did this, this idea emerge? It started uh, by having a virtual coffee with, uh, with Heather, and we would schedule it uh, once a week. And we began to talk about 
uh, the various recovery renewal uh, type frameworks that were were being shared and uh, utilized on uh, the municipal level. And when I was uh, thinking through uh, those frameworks, uh, there emerges recognition that a lot of those frameworks were focused on um, economic recovery or uh, institutional recovery. So how do we get money back into our systems? And in turn, how do we get um, our institutions up and running? I think I'm hearing someone's mic on. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so that, that being said, uh, what, 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 I, what I was finding was with those frameworks, again, the, the focus was on uh, economy and institutional recovery. The question that I was uh, lingering with was, is there a framework or is there something that we can lead communities through that can help with uh, the social economy and the connection between individuals and this notion of a mutual gift exchange, which is uh, at the core of asset-based community development. So what we see in these uh, three, three stages is a crisis, discovery, and resurgence. And in creating the framework, um, the way I, I got inspired by uh, a lot of the self-assessment posters that were popping up at uh, grocery stores, banks, etc. Um, the self-assessment uh, to see if you you have any symptoms of COVID-19. And this self-assessment was something that would lead us to, if you, you did find that you had the symptoms, would lead you into a time of isolation, 14 days. But I was uh, thinking about what if there was an assessment that we can do on ourselves, beginning with ourselves, that can lead to uh, greater socialization. When um, this thought emerged, uh, we, we were still, I believe, in uh, the crisis stage. A lot of things happened. A lot of things happened very quickly. And as a community organizer, uh, this was uh, personally rattling because a lot of my, my work, a lot of our work is face-to-face, uh, interaction with those in our community and now we were uh, relegated to to our homes and the only way we were safely able to connect was on uh, online platforms so in terms uh, in terms of the, the crisis um, I have that idea of activity recreation research and connection and in looking at my own uh, life and what I was going through, something that I realized was within this, within this crisis stage, there was an increase in activity um, because reality uh, was slowly hitting and I was trying to avoid it. And it, there was a lot of increased activity in my life. Um, and in that, relying on uh, some dependencies were, were created there. So uh, binge watching Netflix, uh, Tiger King kept, kept, me, um, kept me focused off of what was, was actually happening. The other thing I noticed was I was in, intentionally recreating uh, online um, online communities or online counterfeits of what was. So I was having virtual coffee chats with friends, virtual happy hours, and I was simply trying to translate what was onto uh, the virtual platform. Also this increase in research where I didn't trust my own knowledge base or that of the community, but I want to see what experts were saying. And then finally that connection piece, uh, a loneliness began to set in where I was seeking connections with, with others. Um, but in this, there was this connection, um, a breadth of connection, not a depth. So I was on many Zoom calls, on social media a lot, trying to connect with a lot of friends. 
uh, all as an attempt, again, to uh, ignore what was, what was happening. And what I noticed was in this crisis, uh, it was very easy to hand over the power I had as a citizen, the power that we had as a community over to institutions, over to systems, over to uh, the professionals. And through this online connection, I was also realizing that the screen became a portal into my own home where through, through a virtual world, my life was slowly being institutionalized. My kitchen table was becoming a boardroom table. Our family room was becoming a classroom. And I was getting incessant emails from various institutions and businesses letting me know that they were okay and hoping that I was okay. Uh, the only benefit out of that was I then realized how many newsletters I was subscribed to and I was able to unsubscribe from a lot of those. <laughs> but, but what was actually hitting me was this, this idea of uh, disembodiment, this online existence. And uh, speaking with, with Cormac and, and hearing uh, some of the things he had to say was within me, was this desire to move from this online to this on land connection, uh, smaller scale uh, interactions with others in, in safe ways. And this moved to that uh, discovery stage where in the crisis patterns uh, were broken, routines were thrown up in the air. But in this discovery stage, as we begin to move out of the crisis, um, I found a fatigue started to, to kick in and saying, I can't do all these activities, I can't maintain all these, all these relationships, but how do I create a manageable pattern? How do I nar um, narrow my circles to connect with people in, in deeper ways? And also there's this confidence that began to build where I recognize the limits of the institutions that I once relied on. And then in that in turn, recognizing the gifts and skills uh, that I had and those that around me had. And then finally, uh, the idea of this uh, resurgence. And that's a, a term I borrowed because people are talking about the possible resurgence of the COVID-19 um, virus in, in our communities. But I, I also see this as an opportunity for a resurgence or renewal within, within community whereby we in turn can um, reclaim citizen and community power uh, in, in engage in inspiring and hopeful work. And what you'll find within all these stages is, um, and Heather, you can let me know when this is going to go public, but uh, there will be a document available with uh, a deeper exploration of these various stages with questions to engage in the self-analysis to say, where am I in this? Am I still in the crisis? Am I ready to engage in discovery? Am I in a point of resurgence? And then in turn, how do we bring this to our communities to assess where our friends, families, or neighbors may be? And say, okay, if we're all in this discovery stage, what are some questions we can begin to ask of ourselves and of one another in turn uh, so that we can build uh, the future or the new reality we wish to see. So some of the questions, and, and I'll end with these questions. So under the, under the crisis stage, um, one of the questions I ask is, uh, what dependencies have been created at this time? And uh, another question is, what is something that you grieve that has been lost? So recognizing those moments of uh, where is where am I giving over my power? Uh, what is occupying that space in my life that I need to reclaim? And what are some things that, I, that I've lost that um, I really miss and taking that, that time uh, to grieve? Uh, under the discovery, um, one of the questions I ask here is, what gifts have you come to recognize in yourself and others? What experiences are you having that are working for you? Um, what is something you have done for yourself that would typically be done for you? And then the importance of story. And this is an element that comes out of uh, asset-based community development. Do you have a story that comes out of this experience that inspires hope? And then uh, 
finally within the resurgence, in what ways has your connection with others energized you? Uh, what are things you needed that you wish you had that the community can now provide? What challenges have been revealed that you feel need to be addressed? And then finally, what capacities have been revealed or strengthened that can assist in addressing these challenges? And in working with the community, there is that essential uh, starting point, begin to ask questions and not entering into those community spaces with answers. And when we see within the crisis stage, uh, what emerges are leaders at the front of the room, assuring people that everything is okay. But once we move from crisis to discovery and in turn resurgence, um, this is something that John McKnight speaks about. We don't look for leadership, uh, but connectorship. We seek connectors in the community that slowly begin to identify the gifts and connect people in meaningful ways so that, and this is a term from Peter Block, so that we may become architects of our own future. Uh, we, as a community, are the professionals in this space. We know what's best for us. And it's my hope that this framework can open up spaces whereby the, the, there can be a resurgence of citizen power and uh, community-driven uh, efforts. And I did 12 minutes, sorry, Heather. <laughs> um. Yeah, we had a lot of coffee conversations and weekly conversations, and it was so inspiring. I was like, Jonathan, we've got to put this all together. We can't just keep this knowledge between you and I. Um, and so he let, he let the cat out of the bag. Um, at the end of our session here, you will get the link to this document that Jonathan's talking about. Um, it is our gift to you. Um, no one else has seen this, so we are launching this with you. Um, and then it will be launched um, in our, our newsletter next month. So thank you for that. Um, we, I, we're gonna move on to Deborah. Are you there? I'm here, thanks so much, Heather. And uh, you know, thank you very much, Jonathan, for, for sharing your journey and talking a little bit about how you've experienced this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna chat a little bit as an employee walking alongside citizens who have been experiencing this. And um, you know, in, in North America, we've really just become kind of disconnected. And you'll often hear people say that a good neighbor is someone who's quiet and some you, you never hear from or don't see. And at Abundant Community in Edmonton, we're really trying to change this. So we focus on place-based, asset-based community development, specifically at the block level. And um, we're a grassroots initiative where the city kind of walks alongside citizens. And um, it started in about 2015. So I would also say that um, the neighborhood, when we talk neighborhood in Edmonton, it really has to be human scale. So by that, I mean about 2000 households and um, your block is usually around 20 houses or maybe even you know, the floor of a building. So if you have a look at the next, slide. Thanks so much, Rite, for, for moving that along for me. I'm going to just chat really briefly about the model, because if you notice, you can go to the City of Edmonton, Abundant Community Edmonton website and look at those two books and learn everything. So I'm just going to go really quick through what we do. Uh, we focus first on neighborhood leadership, looking who is the leadership? Is there a community center that's kind of the hub? Are there people who are movers and shakers? Then we really look for support team members who can help people out to kind of organize at the block level. If we can find one person in that neighborhood who can be a, a neighborhood connector, we get really excited and have the neighborhood leadership, the connect neighborhood connector and the support team try to find block connectors. And it's really the block connector that's key. It's one or two people with about 20 houses or the floor of a building where they really are the point person the person who has block socials or little parties to connect people. And they're also the listener. And I, th I think the key thing that Edmonton um, has been doing around the listener piece is talking to neighborhoods and blocks about their vision. What do they see for their neighborhood? What kind of activities do they wanna do? And really going back to asset-based community development, what skills, gifts, and talents do they want to share? So that's kind of the most important thing I think um, for us at the city. So I'm just looking for the little triangle. Thanks everybody. Perfect. So um, I kind of had a perspective when the pandemic happened and, and, and that crisis started 
um, talking back to Jonathan in those three little areas he was speaking of, it started in mid, mid-March in the city where we kind of had lockdown. And the ACE team, which is really me and Howard Lawrence at that time, thought about how can we keep people connected when they really can't go out and connect with people. They can't go out and see everyone. They're supposed to stay home. So they were being asked to self-isolate, stay home, and they had to stay two meters apart. So it was difficult for us to suggest how people could connect. And we found that we didn't have to. People knew how to do it on their own. So this was really our pandemic perspective is how do we get people to connect? The really interesting thing is that other people, I feel, really had different perspectives. So the the perspective that a lot of other people kind of found was often they focused on, oh, sorry, I went too ahead. Often they focused on the economy. And um, we really began to see other stressors, that's when people started to think about things like loneliness and isolation. How do I manage childcare and work at the same time? And a lot of people were struggling to meet their basic needs. You know, both perspectives are important, connection um, and caring for each other, but also of course the economy is important because people can only take the time to care when their basic needs are met. So the interesting thing that we saw happen in Edmonton, and I'm sure this happened in other municipalities everywhere were what I would call random acts of kindness, right? So we had great examples of citizens taking over, finding solutions and making things happen. So the picture on the left is really food distribution in the park, stop in the park, pick up some food. On the far right, you see free meals for people to come get. And then my favorite in the whole world is this random box of carrots where people could come and get carrots. So this was a group in Edmonton called Yeg Community Response to COVID-19. And they did some amazing things in our city. In a very short time, they had 20,000 followers on Facebook. So it's just an example of how citizens led a response that was needed. Um, They came up with it on our own and they were helping each other in random acts of kindness. In the abundant community Edmonton neighborhoods, what we really saw was more of a local response. In our initiative, we're looking for that longer term connection. And so this caused staff and other people to kind of look at how our neighborhoods who were connected focused really on local care and caring for each other locally, either at the neighborhood and at the block level. And so my staff started to to quote Cormac Russell quite a bit, where we have to go beyond focusing on the needy to focus on being needed and how everyone had to contribute. So in our neighborhoods that were abundant community neighborhoods, they focused on everyone and the exciting part was everyone could contribute. So the nice little lady down the street who maybe couldn't go out at all, she was the one calling everyone and connecting them and seeing how people were doing. And we really realized this at the smaller block level. And it's important because then no one's really left behind in that model. So what we feel is that we really did at the city and in our program, which is really citizen driven, is organized acts of kindness. And I'd like to thank um, Tamar Solomon for the great disconnect little snip I took here from his film. Great film if you can ever watch it. Um, We moved and tried to shift the people in our initiative to organized acts of kindness. And how would that be different than the random ones? So we wanted them to focus on place-based and we found that they did. They were looking at their neighborhoods at the block level and ensuring they were staying in a human scale. They were really focusing on building social capital. So like um, Heather and Jonathan Jonathan have spoke of in, in the article that you see, building social capital can actually be a bigger driver of recovery than the economy. And so I think it's really important to realize that, that when we have a strong social capital in the places where we live, that can almost be, or even can be more important than economy. So um, we organized the blocks and the message didn't really change other than we focused on, please don't leave anyone behind. We don't want anyone feeling isolated or alone. And we found that this kind of connecting and organizing was longer term, right? So the people, the citizens who live in the neighborhoods are building the kind of neighborhood they want. So from there, the city actually worked with citizens and we found citizens telling their own stories and we've been telling stories. So we recently held the first ever neighbor day in Edmonton last weekend and it was pretty incredible. We had tons of neighborhoods doing things. And um, our goal now is to really work with citizens and have them nominate awesome blocks. So we're moving to host the awesome block awards, hopefully 
this fall. So some of the key questions that we have had happen really, uh, if we slide over here to the next one. Sorry, everybody. Thank you so much. So what it really looked like for citizens to be at the center and what we saw is this reimagining or resurgence to use Jonathan and Heather's word is neighborhoods and citizens at the center and they're kind of taking care of their neighborhood and taking responsibility for the neighborhood and the citizens are using their knowledge, skills and experiences and sharing that with everyone. So they've gone from being residents who consume to citizens who are participating in their own well-being. So I met with one of um, our connectors in one of our neighborhoods named Karen Wilk. She lives in Laurier Heights and she's been doing this work since 2015. Her neighborhood is incredibly connected and, and Karen may actually be on this call. So she found in her neighborhood that without becoming official connectors, people just stepped up. All these new block connectors emerged. Neighborhoods figured out creative ways to connect for themselves. The community centers were closed so they met in the park. Neighbors couldn't knock on doors, or if they did, they knocked on them and moved to the sidewalk and had very distanced conversations, but they were checking in on each other. Uh, they organized through Facebook and, and Nextdoor.com, which is a place-based Facebook, really. Um, and then they collaborated um, with other neighborhoods and themselves to make sure that they were connecting each other and learning from each other. So it was amazing work. Municipality, not involved at all. These citizens were really doing what they needed to do to take care of each other. Um, at the city level, we started to collaborate with the folks you saw who were handing out all the food, the Yeg community response to COVID-19. And, and now they're sending us block connectors, we're connecting people, we're talking to them about ABCD and doing place-based work. So it's quite amazing. And we also have done that with some seniors coordinating uh, groups. So I, I found that in a way our municipalities really walked alongside citizens and made changes in that sense. So, you know, what did it really look like and what is the future looking like? We find that people that are meeting and helping each other nearby, they, they don't need our advice, they're figuring it all out on their own. They've shared things, we've heard tons of stories about gardening, puzzles, sourdough starter, buy nothing groups that they're managing, you know, with the way they should and the, and the way they should um, as directed by public health. They're taking care of the common green spaces that the city isn't cutting as frequently because our budget is really, really in trouble. Um, they're creating neighborhood plans. They're connecting blocks for future crisis. And I don't mean just the big crisis. I'm talking the little crisis where somebody on the block breaks a leg, right? Let's think about that future work we can do. So we know now that for our neighborhoods where we have people connected, the neighbors will be there for each other post pandemic. And for us, that's awesome. And so we're hoping that COVID really has created a grassroots response in neighborhoods and that they will work uh, to reimagine how their neighborhoods will operate and how the city can work with them. So we hope that we see potentially less reliance on the municipality and cities taking back, citizens taking back the power and the responsibility for their neighborhoods to create the places they wanna live. And I'm a little bit over, sorry, Heather. That's okay, because the best plans is when you have a buffer, because you know people are gonna go over. <laughs> so thank you very much, Jonathan and Deborah, for sharing, for sharing your stories um, and your local stories and inspiring us on how we can think about, you know, creating a recovery plan where community plays a primary role. Um, I'm looking at the time and, um, should we stop for like five minutes and give people a, a chance to get a fresh cup of coffee and that before we dive into workshops or to our breakout rooms? I'm seeing some nodding heads. Okay, so how about we just take this opportunity to pause. Um, it is 2.48 my time. So how about 2.55? Um, my time, we will come back. Just turn off your, your camera and your microphone and go and freshen up. And this is where uh, music, I could have played some music for those of us who didn't go.
I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of music would you like, Heather? I can play something. Um, I don't know, something happy. <laughs> I'll find something. Beach Boys. <laughs> Oh, we could do a bit of a schools out because this is the week that um, in Ontario, elementary schools are finished and I don't have to be a working mom teacher anymore. <laughs> oh, school finishes in Alberta on Friday too. So it's... I think a lot of us are celebrating. Or maybe we should play celebration. Mm -hmm. Celebrate good times. I think I need to stop my share and start again because I was playing music, but I don't think you guys heard it. I'll, I'll start it again. When I've played music, Rute, I've, I've had to share the screen and in a zoom the bottom left corner there's this share your um sound box mm -hmm. just you know. oh yeah that's true <laughs> um, what did you call it heather celebrate oh i don't know what is it <laughs> Celebrate good times, isn't it? Is that the title? I don't know.
hate to be the one to stop the music. So for those of you who missed the, dis the discussion, it was, uh, we're celebrating that school, elementary school is out um, in most of, in Canada. And so for me with three young children, this is a, this is a, an amazing thing that I don't have Big to be. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the best part um, and the most exciting part. Um, Glenda is going to come on and she is going to um, let us know what she saw in the chat box. Well, first, there is a lot of people who appreciated the chance to do some desk dancing. So thank you for everybody who did that. <laughs> um, over at City Steeping Community, we often do this. I said to Heather, oh, good thing we've been practicing. Um, but it's so cool to see who's here. Like we have people from all over the world. So lots of people from Canada and the US, um, somebody from Haiti, lots of people from the UK, somebody from Southern Australia. So thank you everybody for joining us. And I know that this may be some pretty wonky times for you. So that's even more impressive. Um, and then the one word that we had that people shared, and I love seeing the differences in how like everybody's experience in this particular moment is so different. So there's illuminating and inspiring and challenging, but then also full of opportunities and possibilities. Those are words that came up a lot and ever changing. I think that that's something we can probably all relate to. And then one I appreciated uh, was somebody has discovered that they have a chip addiction, which is great. Um, and I think the word I'll leave it on with is boomerang. That was another fantastic word there. So thank you everybody for sharing your words. Well, whoever wrote chip addiction, we have the same passion. I love <laughs> chips. All right. So we are going to spend the next kind of half hour, 40 minutes, um, in our group conversations. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take time to introduce ourselves. Um, about 10 minutes to introduce ourselves in our small little group so that we start building rela relationship and trust. Um, and then you're going to generate ideas to answer how might we create a recovery plan where the, where the community plays a primary role. And you're going to come up with a, a list of ideas and suggestions. Um, you're going to pick the top idea and then you're going to dive deeper into it. And um, so what future opportunities does this idea create? Um, what role uh, the community plays in this idea, organizations play in this idea, and cities play in this idea, and then are there any general challenges that you might see um, that need to be overcome with this idea? So what we're, we've got, I think, 10 groups. Um, we had prepared to have 14 groups, and we're slowly shrinking a little bit. Um, so we have 10 groups, and so we're going to have, when we finish here, 10 ideas. Um, and then a whole whack of other ideas. And um, my promise to you all is to harvest those ideas, put them together into a document and share them out to you so that you can look at these ideas and see what resonates with your, um, with your communities. Now, um, we're, we're looking at it generally. So don't get bogged down with, well, how could we do this in a youth um, population? Or how can we do this in in, in a seniors population or in a rural community. Just, just think about it generally. Um, and then when, when, you're, when you look at something or find something, you will then take it and you will mold it and craft it to your local context. Um, we, do, um, we do have harvesters in the group. So um, you can focus on dialogue. And we have somebody who's going to be taking um, the notes and helping you keep on track. Um, it is up to your group to get the conversation going and keeping it going um, and moving it forward. Any questions? You will be put into groups. You'll have, so um, Zoom does this all. All you have to do is click on yes. It'll tell you what breakout group you're going in. So harvesters, that is the group. That is the section you're gonna go to. So if you're group number five, you go to harvest number five. Um, and um, yeah, you click on that and it does everything for you. It's really amazing. 
amazing platform. And then we will be all pulled back. We are going to present our ideas. Um, and then I'm going to give you the link afterwards to Jonathan's article when we come back. So we'll see you in a bit. face between institutions and community. Um, institutions should speak with, really recognize um, the strength and potential of local leaders. 
um, and overcome assumptions around who has knowledge and who doesn't. Um, anyone from my group want to add to that or maybe around the boundary spanner idea? Did I capture that okay? We don't have a lot. We don't have a lot of time, so he's going to be very quick because I want to get through all of them. So thank you, Allison. How about group two? Um, okay. All right. Go I'll jump it. in. and then, Oh, Trisha, you want to go ahead? No, go for it, Christine. Go ahead. Um, all right. So our, our big idea was to uh, host listening events. Um, these would be outdoor events and events that could be um, organized on a smaller scale. So rather than having large scale meetings and the purpose would be twofold. One, to provide um, a cathartic, sort of cathartic healing process for people to process what has happened. This is a massive experience that people have undergone in their lives and just recognizing the need for people to still process the past few months. So providing a place and a forum for people to do that. And then secondly, the goal would be to have um, an opportunity to hear the vision of the community members and um, hear their thoughts around assets that have emerged, strengths that have emerged, their vision for community. So really um, taking this idea of listening events and thinking about all the various ways we could do that. So um, there's a lot of phone trees, for example, that were set up during the pandemic, using those phone trees to do listening sessions. Um, looking at doing listening sessions um, in smaller groups, uh, maybe online, different formats, but trying to um, use different mechanisms that already exist to do listening um, and then bring that listening back um, to sort of have a, a, a collective vision of, of what the community's assets and strengths are and where they would like to see uh, recovery efforts um, focus. So some of the challenges are obviously the inability to have large face-to-face um, -face events, um, not sure how online listening events would be able to um, reach um, um, everyone and how it might exclude certain populations, so needing to do other types of listening events. Um, and, and also sort of needing to take out the role of institutions and think about how listening events could be led um, and organized by community members themselves. So those are just some of the thoughts, um, but there was a lot of rich discussion in our group. Anything to add, Trisha or others? No? Okay, group three. Group three. Is group three? Group four. Hi, everyone. I think our big idea in group four was to have like a relationship focused audit and then kind of create an action plan or engagement plan out of that. We talked about creating that inclusive, connected communities that celebrate um, and celebrate each other. We talked about the community and many have spoken already about the whole street connector idea, but how do we really engage and listen, share those ideas, but empower the neighbor to neighbor. Uh, looking at the organizations, nonprofits and other service providers as being those animators and activators connecting people uh, across the neighborhoods. And then having the city have that, uh, the system role, mapping out some of those connections across neighborhoods and across the city. Um, creating the platform to hear the voices from, you know, that greater, uh, I guess, uniquely from each neighborhood, but then across the city, share those stories, share those experience. Um, having the community and organizations challenge the city to create spaces and that place um, space options to allow folks to congregate, get together and celebrate. Um, but some of the challenges with this piece, again, uh, connecting virtually, um, challenges that people can't connect in this way, uh, time, too much, not enough time, um, and the whole focus that we feel kind of this uh, focus on the economics versus the human focus and what will that impact on how we can really switch it and <laughs> focus on the relationships. Thanks. Great idea. Um, group five. Hi, it's Deborah. Um, a lot of the things people have mentioned my group discussed, 
um, just some amazing conversation. Kind of our big idea we tried to pull together is that our group thought that the question itself should really be rephrased to how might community create a plan rather than we. So really focusing on community and that if any of us are there, we're walking alongside. Mm. Uh, we need to reimagine rather than recover what community might want to keep, reimagine or stop. Also that you need the right space and the right people to have the conversation, recognizing that not everyone will want to be involved and that's okay. There were a thousand other things that were said and you'll see it in all the other documents. Great, thank you. Uh, Laverne, group six. I'm gonna go, cause I just like to talk. Uh, so it's Glenda. Group six was such an interesting conversation and we had such a dichotomy in, in ideas and in the ways that we were um, experiencing this. But I think one of the things we came to and correct me if I'm wrong group is that we really felt like community was is nimble and could act quickly and didn't have the red tape and municipal government was able to kind of come alongside and support. And so that's the idea we really want to focus on is how do we harness the agility and nimbleness of community associations and groups and citizen led ideas um, and how does government come alongside um, and support. Love it. All right, so that was group. What am I on now. Were you group six. Yeah, group seven. So that's, that's us. Uh, my group and we had a, a great conversation and I, I figured out that I am really not a great harvester. I'm a great talker. And so <laughs> um, my notes are very, uh, I'm going to have to add some more to it, but we talked about paradigm shift and the shift that government will look after us or, or organizations and institutions will look after us and how do we shift it that, you know, community starts taking care of ourselves and our community. Um, we talked about municipalities that that social capital is not as important in, in, in their rank. Um, talked about com common vision and then we kind of got down to asset mapping and that is where we landed on our big idea um, and it was a community asset map. So going back to the all of the elements the individual and and associations and organizations and physical and the exchange and the culture and go back and 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 ask what was it like prior to and what did we change and happen now um and some of the future opportunities this could create is it helps to build the community story so you only know what you know and so this will help shine some light on some of the amazing things that come out that are in our community um, find the hidden champions um, and highlight the non-traditional leaders um, in this so those care mongering groups and we talked about facebook groups those people who formed those those are champions that you could you could connect with um, and some new leaders and that is as far as we got because we talked a lot and had a great good conversation so um, group eight all right that's us so we focused uh, we had lots of different ideas but we really focused on um, community conversations and engaging with community members because we uh, like other groups have mentioned there is uh, typically this ownership of municipalities on you know community economic development when it comes to recovery and so like you said Heather like there's not a huge focus on social capital so we talked about you know hosting conversations about recovery related to COVID-19 but also this mind shift on um, this the role that community plays in, uh, I think someone said, instead of using the word recovery, um, like revisioning or, or resurgence or something like that. And I know that Mary and our group had talked a lot about, um, um, oh my gosh, I just lost my thought. Um, hold on here. Resurgence, changing it. No, on a, like uh, starting the conversation with what is this new vision? We're not going to go back to the way that things may have been handled. What is it that you, we want to do now? Because this is our time to really change, um, you know, the role uh, of community versus institution or being supported by, you know, cities and municipalities, but letting the community leave, lead. And so we, uh, Mary also noted that it's really important to start 
really small and start local. So, you know, mm. you could start hosting those conversations with a local church group or with people in a shared apartment building, et cetera. Great. Okay. Group nine. I'm just, these are amazing. I am just so excited. Hi, it's Turi. Um, our discussion did not identify an exact idea, but did identify a central theme around building trust. Mm -hmm. And the discussion really centered around the, the fact that the pandemic has really amplified a lot of the power imbalances that exist, has amplified how funding flows, especially during COVID, to large organizations who then will funnel down to small organizations. And one of the participants in the call gave a great example of when the large organization finally came to community and said, we're here to help you. And community said, we've been doing this for four weeks, where have you been? Um, so we you know, didn't get a chance to like, dig into this as much as we wanted, but I think we talked about, this is a great opportunity for us to really talk about that long overdue redistribution of power, um, that long overdue, how do we engage with community? We should wait to be invited to them rather than us inserting ourselves into. Uh, lots of really great conversations about really, you know, who's, who's, who should be there, who has the right to lead, you know, who has the power. I, I'd love to talk about this more, but. <laughs> it, we, we actually talked in, in my last session unconference session, we talked about power and privilege and, you know, how that came to light during this time and what, how do you, how do you, um, do, like re redistribute it and gifts and your assets, etc. So yeah, great conversation. Um, Bonnie, do we get you? Let's hear from you. Now you do. Group 10, the fabulous group 10. Um, I just need to say, um, I was so into the conversation also, Heather, that I wasn't a very good harvester either. Um, but I did write a lot. It's hard to kind of chat and to write at the same time, apparently. So the, the, you know, shorten the suite of the great conversations. First of all, we represented the UK, United States, and a little bit heavy on the Ontario, but it was, I really appreciated the group that I was with. So our lens really at the bottom, you know, at the end of all of our conversations was really about putting a lens on the people, on citizens. Um, and some of the ideas that we discussed were um, really about building space for people to come together to share their stories. So this kind of builds on a lot that the other groups had spoke about, you know, um, you know, providing this opportunity for people to come and have conversations about what's happened and what the future might look like, whether that's online or whether that's, you know, down the road in person. Um, so this creation of space for people to come together. Um, let's see, what else is there? You know, those conversations about engaging the citizens, you know, we're just starting to get to that place about, okay, so how do we do, you know, how do we really do that? How do we bring people together? And um, like many of you said too, it's around invitation, you know, building that space for people to come. And I didn't say this, but I think it's about showing up. Um, you know, showing up and providing that space and continue to show up, um, you know, and, and provide opportunities. Yeah, I could go on and on, but that's kind of the short and sweet and my gratitude to a uh, fantastic group. That's great. Thank you. Did I miss a group? I feel like I missed somebody. Uh, did you get group 10? That was, that was me. 10. You jumped yeah, over four, I think. Group yeah, three? Whoever couldn't speak. Yeah, it was group three. Group three. Well, I hope group three took some notes because I'm just looking at the time and I was told by the conference organizers I can't go over. So, Rita, can you just share your screen? Um, so we had some great conversations. Um, and we are gonna harvest these and we'll put it all together. I just wanted to highlight that we are committed to continuing this, um, this conversation. Um, we have cities deep in community. We have areas where you can learn that we maybe do a webinar on this. Jonathan, Deborah, maybe we should turn this into a webinar so we can share it even more. Um, we have our asset-based community development community of practice that happens and our neighborhood leaders. So you can just go to our website and learn more. And we just launched a 
podcast where it's about deepening community and right now we're going to be launching um, loneliness um, and the built environment loneliness and uh, social media loneliness and seniors and we're going to dive deep into it so we're really excited about that podcast we just launched it last month um, I'll make sure you get the link and lastly I just want to thank um, our presenters Deborah and Jonathan, a lot of work went into this. Um, our harvesters, I tapped you at last minute. Thank you so much for sharing your gift with everybody here. And I want to thank you all here for sticking around to the end. Glenda is putting in the link right now to that document Jonathan talked about so that you can download that um, and get first view of it. Um, and yeah, let's Let's add some asset-based community to our recovery, our thinking, our organizations. So thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day, evening, morning. Thank you. What about your photo? Oh, oh, wait, wait, thank you. I want a photo. So if you wanna be in the photo, I have three, I have three, I take three separate photos. So turn on your screen. Trisha, turn on your screen. Allison, turn on your screen. Let's be in it. So I'm taking the first picture. Oh, you know what? I need a Word document, just a second. Okay, I am taking- Hurry up, hurry up. I am, I am, I'm trying. Oh, my computer, you wanna know why? Because I'm rushing. Okay, one, two, three, you're taking the first one. Pasting that one. I am taking the second one. And I'm pasting that one. And we are done. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Thanks for a very good conversation. Thank you so Bye. much, everyone. Bye. 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 It's a pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks you, everybody. Yes, Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, meme. Bye. bye. Warm and nice in Haiti. Oh, yeah. I'm all jealous of you being in Haiti a little bit. <laughs> or I am anyway. <laughs> I'm going to Haiti tomorrow morning. I'm going to this. Oh, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> yep. Going to do one of the sessions there. I'm going all over the world. It's great. <laughs> OK. Oh. Hmm. All right, Rute, do you have ultimate? Thank you so much, Heather and Rute. Rute is a great Zoom keeper. Bye. She is. Thank you. Um, how do I do this? I don't know how to end this. It won't let me. <laughs> oh, there we go.